good afternoon and welcome to the very first event of the semester in our Rewilding Planet Earth series. It's really nice to see you all in person. Uh, my name is Tara pisani Garo. I'm the Director of Environmental Studies and I've been working with faculty across the campus to bring you this series this year on, called Rewilding Planet Earth and it's supported by a grant from the Institute for Liberal Arts. And this particular event is co-sponsored by the Office of Global Engagement and the Jesuit Institute. So my thanks to them for all the help in putting this together. So let me just tell you a little bit about Rewilding Planet Earth. The series came about because we wanted to invite our campus to really take seriously the biodiversity extinction crisis, a, an area that we don't talk about as much as climate change and also to think critically and to reflect on our relationship with nature and to participate in the UN Decade for Ecosystem Restoration. So the series emphasizes both the need to be as informed as possible and to stay engaged through shared action, community involvement, and a commitment to the common good. So biodiversity loss, like I said, doesn't get as much attention as climate change, but the two are basically like two heads of the same coin or twin crises. So by rewilding our degraded ecosystems, we create carbon sinks. We increase our resilience to extreme weather events. We purify the air. We improve access to fresh water. And we also flourish in our human communities. So in Laudato Si, which I know you're all familiar with, Pope Francis implores all of humanity to experience an ecological conversion of mind and habits a, co a conversion that's essential not only to biodiversity, but also to the future of our own species. So with that in mind, I invite you to follow the Rewilding Planet Earth series, which can be found on the ILA website. The next event will be on March 1st with Pete Malinowski. He's the co-founder of the Billion Oyster Project, which is bringing back marine species in the New York Harbor. So this is a positive environmental story that we wanna share with you and use that to inspire other actions. So I'll tell you a little bit about the format for tonight's talk. Uh, our presenter, Gopal Patel, will be giving about a 45 minute presentation and then we're gonna move to a table here and engage you in conversation, a QA. and a uh, We'll end by 5.45 um, and we do have two microphones they will have to turn on to ask your question. So let me give a little introduction to our, our esteemed guest here. This is Gopal Patel. He is the co-founder and director of Bhumi Global, a nonprofit organization that works to educate and mobilize Hindu communities globally for environmental action. Bhumi Global works with global institutions such, such as the United Nations Environmental Program and the Worldwide Fund for Nature. And this is to present Hindu perspectives on the environment and sustainable development. He's also the co-chair of the United Nations Multi-Faith Advisory Council and is a member of the advisory board to the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. And both of these contexts have put him in a place to be working with engaging with the Convention for Biological Diversity's global framework for uh, nature and biodiversity and to guide actions worldwide through 2030. So I met Gopal at COP26 in Scotland at a panel that he was on about the role of faith-based organizations in securing a nature-positive future. So he and other panelists were asked um, a question from the moderator that was, what lessons have you learned from your work and your faith about how best to connect with people to move them into action to conserve and restore biodiversity? Basically addressing the persuasion challenge that we all have. Now, many of the panelists boiled it down to one word, if you might remember, and Gopal Patel, his word was service. And he said, the service that we're here, that we're here to serve one another, to serve the earth, and to serve the divine. And in that spirit of service, we can make the ecological conversion that's needed to sustain the diversity of life on the planet. So that's when I decided that I would invite Gopal to Boston College to a Catholic Jesuit university that has a rich tradition in social justice and service. And so the idea, idea being today that we start a conversation here at Boston College and continue it on throughout this year and beyond about how we might use our faith and multiple faith perspectives to create a nature positive future. So please join me in welcoming Gopal Patel to Boston College. <laughs> 
Thanks, Gobel. Thank you, Tara, for that introduction. And I've had a great day so far here at Boston College. It's my second time here. I was here briefly in November, but it's been really great. So good meeting the students at lunch and all the um, professors I met um, over the last couple of hours. Thank you for your time. Um, and COP was great, but there's still a lot more work that needs to be done. And so I'm really excited that Boston College is taking this effort to engage in the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Um, so as Katara said, I'm going to speak for about 45 minutes. If I met you earlier today and I said some of the things I'm going to share right now, I do apologize um, for the repetition. Um, and so I'll speak about 45 minutes on the work around um, that, I, that we do at the United Nations when it comes to um, biodiversity, ecosystem restoration in a multi-faith context, and then lean into some of the Hindu values or teachings that, um, that we talk about in, in, in the work that we do and that may be points of inspiration for all of you in the service that you do as well. So as Tara mentioned, we're here to talk about biodiversity. Um, and as Tara said, it doesn't get as much attention as climate change. And we, there are different ideas for why that may happen. I won't go into that right now. But as Tara said, climate change gets the space, but biodiversity is a twin concern. And I would say in many ways, a much more larger existential concern that we may have when it comes to the environment. Um, just because it's so, so much more complex, right? With climate change, we know what the solutions are. We know what the causes are, right? For climate change, we know the causes are um, carbon emissions, uh, fossil fuels, extractive industries, and we know what the solutions are to climate change, going to renewable energy, reducing our carbon emissions. I mean, it's all pretty... Not easy, but it's a little bit more straightforward when it comes to reducing carbon and, and, and how we can get to a net zero world. It's not easy to do it, but at least the solutions on paper are, are relatively straightforward. The financing needs to flow in the right directions and so on. But with biodiversity, we're talking about literally the web of life, from, from the food we eat to the air we breathe to um, the places where we go on recreation. The whole world is is the biodiversity um, world that we live in. And therefore, to find a single solution to the biodiversity crisis is not possible. It really does require a whole systems approach if we are to address the biodiversity crisis. So when we talk about the biodiversity crisis, before we talk about maybe some of the solutions, what is the biodiversity crisis? Anybody here working on biodiversity? Anybody here have a sense of the scale of destruction we're causing to, to the world when it comes to biodiversity? Any quick show of hands? Not so many. One, two, a few, right? I'm not going to go into too much detail, but just to give you a sense. So firstly, the rate of extinction of natural species. We know in the natural world there's a natural rate of extinction that takes place, but what we've seen over the last 50 years is that the rate of extinction is between 100 to 1,000 times what is normal in the natural world for species to go extinct. Um, I don't need to tell you that's an alarming number. Um, since 1970, in the, in, the, um, uh, in the WWF Living Planet report that came out in 2020, it said that since 1970, in the 50 years since then, there's been a two-thirds or about 60-70% um, decline in biodiversity globally, right? So that's an alarming rate of extinction, and in the last 50 years, we've lost two-thirds of biodiversity globally. And it's different in different parts of the world as well. So if we look here in North America, again, just picking out a few statistics so you get a sense, here in North America, about 3 billion birds have been lost in the last 50 years. That's a staggering number. Um, in Central Asia and Europe, we see that there's only about 23% of species and 16% of habitats, uh, habitats are in good health. In Latin America, since 1975, they've experienced a 94% loss in their biodiversity. It's a staggering number. And in India, where I used to do a lot of work, about 12% of wild animal species are threatened with extinction. So you see across the board, there's this crisis going on that in many ways we don't even notice. I remember when I was a child, um, butterflies were such a thing. Like you would see butterflies in the garden when I was growing up in England. It's so rare now in England to see butterflies. And I think the same here in the US and in different parts of the world as well. Things that we were just so used to seeing 
um, about 10, 20, 30 years ago, we're just not seeing anymore. And this is, this is the fabric of life, the web of life, as many of us like to call it. And it's literally unraveling in front of us. And unfortunately, the main cause of the biodiversity loss and the crisis that we're facing is due to human behavior. Um, we like to call this the drivers of biodiversity loss. Um, so these are the, what, we, what we say are the five main causes of the loss is, is, is um, habitat loss, where humans are encroaching on land that belongs to animals or onto land for expanding cities and, 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 and human civilization, so to speak. Invasive species, species coming into places where they may not necessarily live. Overexploitation, pollution, and also climate change also adds to the biodiversity crisis. And so we are the drivers of biodiversity loss. We, through our habits, through our lifestyles, through our consumption, we are taking more from the earth than, than the earth can replenish herself. And if we don't drastically change how we live and how we consume, then at the rate we're going, the, the future does not, <laughs> unfortunately, the future does not look very good. And it's, it's, a, it's an uncomfortable truth. And those of us who work in this space, and I know many of us in this room do work in this space on a, on a daily basis, um, sometimes the ability to get up in the morning or to face this reality becomes harder and harder each week and each year as, as, as the crisis goes on and, and the political will to address it doesn't seem to be stepping up to the table in the way that it needs to. But there are efforts to address the crisis and everyone can do something. And as Tara said, um, service. A, Hindu, a very simple Hindu idea is how can I serve? That's like one of the most fundamental questions a Hindu will ask themselves is in any context, in any environment, how can I be of service in this moment to contribute to the greater good? And I'll get onto that in a little bit. But Tara mentioned this United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. It was launched last June on World Environment Day. I'm fortunate to serve on the advisory board for that. And the Decade on Ecosystem Restoration is a joint program between the Food and Agriculture Organization at the UN and the United Nations Environment Program. And they're asking all of us over the next decade to really put into focus restoring the environment, to, to work on this, this effort of ecosystem restoration. Because by doing so, we can address all the things I was just mentioning. We can address issues around climate change. We can address issues around health. We can address issues around clean water. By restoring the environment where it is degraded, we can help the economy in those local areas as well. And so by restoring biodiversity, by restoring landscapes, by restoring waterways, oceans, and rivers, we can, there are a number of benefits beyond just the monetary benefit that we may immediately think of that are of value, of use to us. United Nations, they call ecosystem, I wanted to put the official definition up just so we all are singing from the same hymn sheet, so to speak. It's a, a process of reversing the degradation of ecosystems, such as landscapes, lakes, oceans, to regain their ecological functionality. In other words, to improve the productivity and capacity of ecosystems to meet the needs of society. This is, can be done by allowing the natural regeneration of overexploited ecosystems or by planting trees and other plants. So it's a relatively easy thing. We just need to go out and plant some trees and not overexploit. You know, it, 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 it's in one level, on one level, it's very easy. But on the other hand, the way that human society has gone over the last 50 years with our encroachment into these landscapes, into our overconsumption, the hardest part is how do we change our behavior so that our efforts to restore these landscapes, to restore the rivers, to restore the forests can be functional and, 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 and sustainable. And so there are many ways that we can move people into this work of ecosystem restoration, into protecting biodiversity and reversing the biodiversity loss. Now, a lot of people, I would say most people are motivated in the world by, by the dollar, by the pound by trying to make some money, and they see the economic value of nature, and they feel that if we can protect the environment, it'll be good for, for the bottom line, which is okay to a certain extent. There are people who are motivated for political reasons or philanthropic reasons. 
I do this work, and, and Tara mentioned some of the organizations I'm involved with, I do this work and I've been doing this work for the last uh, 12, 13 years now with working with religious and spiritual organizations globally to put forward the moral, spiritual, ethical case for why we need to protect the environment. And that's really what I want to focus my remarks on today. And a question may come up, why, why religious organizations? What can religious institutions offer that governments and think tanks and finance can't offer? Well, in addition to the, uh, the moral framing that religions provide, and I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit, if you just look at the hard assets of, um, of, of faith-based institutions, uh, and we have Matthew here from an organization called Faith Invest, and they're working with helping faith-based organizations align their investments with their values. Um, because we know, estimates show that I think faith-based organizations collectively are the third largest investing block in the world. And so if we were to encourage religious institutions and organizations to divest from fossil fuels, which many of them are doing, and to start investing in green, renewable technologies and industries that are um, planet-friendly, shall we say, that's a significant shift if the third largest investing block was to do that en masse. That would change um, the game in so many different ways. Schools or educational institutions, we're here at Boston College, you know, a, a Jesuit institution. I think somewhere in the region of about 25 to 50% of all schools globally were either founded or are run by religious institutions. And so we have the ability to reach so many people through our, um, through our educational institutions. When you talk about publications, so many religious publications coming out on a daily basis, um, news channels, um, social media, there's a significant reach that we have. And then also the land that religious institutions hold, both in terms of forests and, and, and so on, but also the physical buildings that religious institutions own and maintain. And so if you combine all of this together, you know, oftentimes people will ask us, you know, why do you work with the religious institutions? And actually the answer is, why not work with religious institutions? Because they are so huge, um, they are so impactful, so powerful, um, and in many ways are some of the oldest living institutions in the world. Religious institutions were alive long before um, some of the current countries in the world came into existence, and those religious traditions will be alive long after some of those countries cease to be. And so they are carriers of wisdom, of knowledge, and culture that spans generations, you know, depending on which story you believe, from the beginning of time, from the beginning of man. And so the question is, why aren't we working with religious institutions, faith-based organizations, to address issues around climate change, biodiversity loss, and ecosystem restoration? And so I want to talk now a little bit about two main ways that religious groups can do that. The first is what I was just talking about, which is greening of our own institutions. This is the Green Mosque in Cambridge. It's the first Green Mosque that was built in the, in the United Kingdom. There are several others. I know there's one in India, I think in Bangalore. I'm not sure if there's a certified Green Mosque in the United States, there may be. But one obvious thing, and I think what people all initially think about when they think of greening religion is, oh, let's green the church, let's green the mosque, let's green the synagogue. And that's important and it's needed. We do need to get our own houses in order before we can go out and um, spread the good news, so to speak, before we can go out and encourage others to, to live a life of sustainability and environmental responsibility. We do need to get our own, um, our own houses in order. And it's not just the institutions or the buildings, but it's also the festivals that we may observe, the rituals that we may partake in, the pilgrimages that we may go on. There, is a whole in, there are whole industries surrounding religion, faith, spirituality. If anybody here is a practitioner of yoga, the number of yoga retreats that are going on in Costa Rica and Puerto Rico on any given week is you know, in, the, in the dozens, I'm sure. So there's a whole, there are whole industries that are around spirituality, religion, and faith. And we need to ensure all of those are green or as sustainable as possible. And you see in different religious institutions and traditions really significant efforts that are pointing in the right direction. In the Catholic Church, we have Laudato Si that I'm sure all of you are very familiar with um, that came out in 2015, which has had uh, a significant impact. I was saying earlier, 
significant impact, not just in the Catholic Church, but I see the biggest impact of Laudato Si outside of the outside of the Catholic Church and actually in other religious traditions and in secular spaces and in development spaces where sometimes where you wouldn't expect when someone mentions, oh, Pope Francis said this, so we have to do this. You know, so the impact is 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 quite far reaching. But then you have other organizations. There's a there's a group uh, we're connected with here in the United States called Interfaith Power and Light. They have regional chapters um, and they work on greening places of worship um, to ensure that houses of worship are, can meet their net zero targets. And then you also have institutions taking on this work, like the World Resources Institute, which is the world's largest or well-known sustainability think tank. In the last couple of years, they've started their own faith program where they're helping faith-based organizations reduce their carbon emissions as well. And so part of the work and the starting place has to be getting our own faith-based institutions, spiritual organizations, living up to the values that I think we can all agree are at the heart of our spiritual traditions, which is to live in harmony and balance with the natural world. That has to be the first starting point. And that was my focus for, the, for, for many years. And in the last number of years, my focus has increasingly shifted to working at the United Nations and ensuring that faith-based voices are at the table when international policy is being developed when it comes to climate change and biodiversity. And this may not be um, obvious to some of us that faith can be at the table, but very much so. The UN is opening up in a way that probably it never has, particularly when it comes to the environment, where it is inviting religious voices, spiritual voices, faith-based voices to contribute to the policy and the development of the United, of the United Nations Environment Program and its, and its associated um, agencies and processes, because in many ways, the world is stuck. The UN is stuck. We see the multilateral system collapsing almost before our eyes. We see member states unable to see the crisis and work together in order to move the needle forward. And so what is, what is very desperately needed, and the UN, are, I've never heard them explicitly say this, but I've heard people say it kind of behind the scenes, is that new thinking is, is, is required. The UN came out of a particular time in history, a particular dark time in human history after the Second World War, and it was fit for purpose for what it aimed to do at that time, to bring peace to the world, to make sure there were no more global conflicts. But the world has changed since that time in the 70 years that's passed. The geopolitical nature of the world is changing. We're seeing the rise of the East, and we're seeing real um, identity crisis in many ways for liberal Western democracies, Western Europe and North America specifically. So as these changes are literally happening in front of our eyes, the UN has to change, it has to reform, it has to reflect the world that it is serving. And in many ways, historically, it has served um, the Western world or has served the world through a Western lens. And it needs to now, in many ways, serve the world reflecting the different spiritualities and cultures and traditions that it seeks to represent. And so there is an invitation, a very open invitation from different parts of the UN for faith-based organizations to step up. And so I'm gonna give you two examples of the way that we're doing that at the UN. And Tara, give me like a 20 minute note and then a 10 minute note when I'm almost done, thank you. So the first thing that we're doing, um, again, I'm just using these to give you examples of how religious groups are engaging in advocacy at the UN. Um, there's a conference coming up in China in June. This is 2020, because this conference was supposed to be in 2020, um, and then it got moved to 2021, now it's in 2022. So in June, um, the UN, um, it's called the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, will meet in China. And over the last two years, the UN have been drafting a new 10-year framework to address the biodiversity crisis. It's called the Global Biodiversity Framework, or the GBF. Um, the first draft came out in June of last year. And since then, there's been a consultative process where the UN are asking different stakeholder groups to input their feedback on the document before it is finalized in June. And so different groups, business groups, um, indigenous groups, um, groups that are focused on gender, are all saying and giving their input into what the document should look like um, based on their own perspectives. And so we've been working over the last six to eight months with about 60 different religious groups from across the world who are all engaged at the UN 
to provide a, fa a multi-faith response to the current draft of the Global Biodiversity Framework. Um, because we feel as a community of religious organizations at the UN, we have something to say because we are concerned about the crisis and we have, we have concer deep concerns about the text as it stands right now. And so you may be asking yourself, well, what kind of things are you saying in this document? What can you offer from a religious perspective to a, to a very technical, detailed um, UN document? So I'll give you two examples. The first is that the document is still working with, which is what I think, which is an old, outdated, troublesome paradigm, which is that humans and nature are separate. That nature is only of value because of its economic uh, merit that it has to human society, right? That's the thinking that got us into this problem in the first place, starting from the Industrial Revolution. Um, and it's still the thinking that pervades all of our major institutions right now, that nature is only there as an economic resource. And so we are saying as a multi-faith community that that framing has to fundamentally shift in this new framework that you're developing, that we need to talk about interconnectedness, relationship, interdependence with nature, that we are not separate, we are interconnected at a very deep fundamental level. And unless this document reflects that, it's gonna be the same as we've seen for the last 50 years. The other thing that we're talking about, we're talking about six different things in our response to the document. One of the other issues we're mentioning is the rights of indigenous people. That we feel that indigenous people, historically, indigenous peoples and communities have been wronged in many ways by the development sector um, and that any, any um, conversations going forward that involves the lands that indigenous people care for and live on needs to actually involve indigenous peoples and communities. And we as the faith community at the UN very strongly feel that that needs to be part of this new framework, which currently um, it does not reflect that as strong as we would like. So those are just two examples of how we as a multi-faith community at the United Nations are stepping out of just saying we need to green our churches and temples and mosques, but actually we have things to say when it comes to these technical policy documents that the UN are developing. One of the other things that we're doing, um, talking specifically to the, to the decade on ecosystem restoration, is that this spring we're going to be hosting a number of online dialogues and consultations, looking at different case studies across the world and seeing how we can use the lenses of spirituality, values, and culture to mobilize people into doing work around ecosystem restoration. And so if I give an example, we're going to be looking in India at, the, at a river called the River Yamuna, which is a sacred river. Um, it's he very heavily polluted. Um, actually, it's considered to be a dead river. No life can live in that river once it leaves, once it leaves Delhi. And so we're going to convene a dialogue between, hopefully, representatives of the government, um, private sector, religious leaders, local activists and communities to see how can we look at this issue of the pollution of the Yamuna from a spiritual, cultural and value perspective. Not just from a, it's important that we, people talk about it from a health impact and an economic impact and they're all really important, but we really believe that faith is a motivator for mo mobilizing people into action. And so we'll be doing that in the Yamuna. Um, we'll be looking at Rome. We're going to be looking at cities. So Rome is going to be the case study we use. Um, we're going to look at um, a, a, part, a, a town in Louisiana, which I forget the name of, which is known as Cancer Alley, where people who are born there have disproportionately high number of, um, uh, disproportionately high number of cancer. I see some nodding in the audience. I think people may know where I'm talking about. And so we're going to choose f three or four of these places across the world and see how we can talk about these issues from a cultural, spiritual values perspective, which will then hopefully, which will then actually inform the work of the decade on ecosystem restoration. We'll be producing a handbook, probably workshops and trainings that we can go out into the development sector, into the conservation sector to talk about these issues. And I have 20 minutes. This is perfect. All right. So let me quickly move on. Um, so let me get some water. And I'm, I'm sorry that it's a plastic bottle. I, I didn't do it, I, I swear. I'm not going to say who did. OK, for the second part. So framing is important. Like It's important to know when we're talking about a subject matter where we're standing from, right? And oftentimes, what we find is that we're all talking about the same thing, but we're all talking about it from different framings or different perspectives. 
And so what I want to do is present to you uh, the framing that Hinduism has when it talks about the environment. Um, because it's important, because it, it's similar, but it's different. All religions are the same, but actually every religion is very different at the same time, right? So it's important to know what the differences are, and I want to present where Hinduism um, stands when it, talks about, when it talks about the environment. And like any good story about religion, let's start with creation, because I feel like the Hindu story of, or there are many stories of creation within Hinduism. The one I'm most familiar with and my favorite is, which is what I'll talk about. And then that will then hopefully lead us into the kind of the other ideas that I want to present. So let's start with the story of creation within Hinduism, or one of the stories of creation within Hinduism. Anyone seen this picture before? <laughs> I knew you would have seen it. <laughs> Maybe two, three. Okay, I knew the Indians would have seen it. Um, so this, this is Vishnu. Vishnu is an avatar of, of God, a form of God. Vishnu takes different forms. Um, this is Vishnu lying in an ocean. And as he's lying there, he, he breathes. He's in the cosmic sky, in the spiritual sky, and like all of us, he breathes. And as he breathes in and out, you'll see these bubbles are surrounding him. And as he breathes out, out of every single pore of his body, a bubble emanates. And in every single bubble is a universe. And it exists in his time for a second, in our time for millions of years. And so as he breathes out, these bubbles come into manifestation. And as he breathes in, the bubbles go back into his body and go into a period of hibernation or disillusion. And this is the eternal kind of, um, not work, but this is what he eternally does. He's constantly breathing in and out, creating life and then, and then dissolving life constantly. And for him, what is a second for us are millions of years. So he has innumerable bubbles coming out of his body, out of every single pore of his, of his skin. And so as these bubbles come out, he enters into each of the bubbles, which is its own universe. He enters into each universe as another form of Vishnu. And as he's laying there on another ocean with a multi-headed serpent, um, a lotus flower comes out from his navel. And I, I, I hope you can see that. From his navel, you'll see a lotus flower is emerging. And at the top of the lotus flower is a being that is created called Brahma who is considered to be the father or the, the, the personality that actually creates the material realm. Because so far what we're talking about is the spiritual realm, the, the lying in the ocean, the breathing of the bubbles, the universes, all mainly spiritual. So Brahma is created and he sits there on the top of this lotus flower for years, many, many years, wondering who am I and why am I sitting here? And he goes through into deep meditation. He goes into the lotus. There are different stories about what he does when he's there. But ultimately, he realizes that his job is to create. His job is to create the world. And he needs to create the world so that the souls, so that we and all other life can live in those worlds. And so what he does is that he starts singing. He starts singing Sanskrit prayers and hymns. And through the sacred sound vibrations that are coming out of his mouth, all life is created. And it's said like through his sound vibration, the plants are created, the animals are created, the air is created, the oceans, and crucially, we are created. And in each of, that, each of those forms of life that Lord Brahma creates through the singing, uh, Vishnu enters into each of those forms of life as another form of Vishnu. Um, so we have three different forms of Vishnu right now. You have the top one, the middle one, and this the localized version that's sitting in the heart of every living being. This is only one story of creation within Hinduism. So Brahma creates by singing, and all of life that we see around us is manifested through that singing. I hope I'm correct or close enough. <laughs> now, how does it work once this is done? Like, what happens next? So you have this fantastic story about how the world is created, but then what keeps it running? What keeps it going? And like I said earlier, in Hinduism, a lot of it is about just asking questions about why, why, why. 
Um, that's why you find it, if you meet many Indians, they're quite argumentative sometimes because they just want to keep asking questions. Um, and so the earliest Hindu sages were like, what is going on? Where are we? What is this thing that we're living in? What is controlling everything that moves and does not move? And so certain ideas were put forward, and they're not religious laws or theological ideas. They're just like ideas that actually they thought, oh, we think this is what's going on here. And this is how we think we need to function to ensure that this space keeps functioning. And so the initial, very initial idea that comes forward out of Hinduism is an idea called Ritta, which is found in the Rig Veda. Um, and I apologize if there's any Sanskrit students in the audience or any Indians, my Sanskrit is terrible, so please forgive me and correct me if I'm butchering it. Um, but there's this idea in the Rig Veda called Ritta, which means universal order or balance, that the universe is a fine system where there is balance, there's equilibrium. And it's created in such a way for, because that's how things are sustained. There has to be an order, there has to be a balance in order for something to be sustained. And we all know if there's something is finely tuned, as soon as something goes out of sync, the whole thing starts erupting and collapsing. And that's what we see currently with our bio biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis. We are deeply out of sync, out of balance, out of order with the world. And so Ritta comes forward, the Rig Veda comes forward with this idea of Ritta, and then other ideas are put forward, the idea of Dharma, the idea of Ahimsa, the idea of Sattva. I won't go into them, they may be familiar with, with, with some of you, but the idea that Dharma means to uphold or to sustain. Many Hindus will talk about living a Dharmic lifestyle, which literally means to sustain and uphold, and that works at an individual level, at a community level, at a global level, and a cosmic level. We all have a responsibility to maintain the balance and the order to ensure that things can sustain and go forward. To live a life of non-harming, to live a life of goodness, which is wholesome, which is healthy, which is not destructive. And so these are some of the ideas that come out of Hinduism, which I hope some of you are seeing how they lead them or lend themselves to Hindu environmental practice or how we hope Hindus act when they think about the environment. So this is one way. The other way which I mentioned is that um, as Brahma sings and all these beings are created, what also happens is that um, what we may consider gods with a lowercase g descend to the planet as well and take on forms. And so I mentioned the river Ganges earlier. Well, the river Ganges actually, from the Hindu perspective, is a goddess. This is her, river Ganga. She, God, Ganga Devi, sorry, she rides on a crocodile. And this is her form in the spiritual realm. But when she takes when she descends to this realm, she takes the form of a sacred river. And so that is why she is sacred for Hindus, not because she's a river, but actually she is a goddess, and this is her form, her eternal spiritual form. And you see that right across Hinduism, that you'll see the elements having spiritual forms in the spiritual realm, and when they descend and come into this realm, they take on forms that we need or we can relate to. And so this is one. And then there's also the stories in Hinduism as well, which are replete with, um, with references to nature. This is Krishna, um, and Krishna was a cowherd. He lived in the town called Vrindavan, um, just a few hours south of Delhi, and he, he's always with cows. Krishna is always with cows. Um, and I'll speak about cows a little bit later on. But every story associated with Krishna, there is an element of the natural world with him, whether he's with cows or whether he's sporting in the river Yamuna or whether he is in the forest with his friends. There is always a natural element, an, an element of the natural world which is deeply associated with Krishna because he lived not in a city. Well, actually, in his later life, he lived in a, in a city. But in his early life, he lived in the forest. And he was a cowherd boy living in the forest, taking care, of, taking care of cows. Another story is that of Lord Ram. Um, sorry if I'm saying all these words that aren't registering. Lord Ram is another avatar incarnation of, of Vishnu. Ram, for 14 years, he was exiled to the forest because he couldn't be king. And so he went there with his wife Sita and his brother Lakshman, and he lived in the forest for 14 years. Um, again, his story, the Ramayan, is so full of um, imagery about the natural world and him living in the forest. 
And actually later on, if you know the story, um, his wife is kidnapped and taken to Lanka, modern day Sri Lanka, and Ram has to mobilize an army to rescue his wife. And so the head of his army is Hanuman, which is the, which we call the monkey, monkey formed God. You may, the monkey God in, in, in Hinduism. And Hanuman is the chief of his army. And Ram has this army of monkeys and animals. And actually the imagery of that is so beautiful that you have different spiders and, you know, monkeys and different things all helping Ram build a bridge from India to Sri Lanka to rescue Sita. So there's so much rich natural imagery within these texts that Hindus really relate to when they think of these deities that they worship. You cannot think of Ram without thinking of the forest. You cannot think of Krishna without thinking of the cows. They are inseparable. They are always together. And then you have the planet as a whole. And I, I have only have one quote because I don't want to share too many. Well, I have two. Um, this is from uh, the Bhagavad Purana, um, where it says that the ether, the air, the fire, and the water, the earth, the planets, and all creatures, directions, plant, trees, and plants, rivers, and seas, they are all organs of God's body. And remembering this, a devotee respects all species. So here you're having a sense of this cosmic idea that even the planet itself is God. And that everything is connected to him. I like this one even better, where it says the rivers are the veins of the cosmic person, and the trees are the hairs of his body, the air his breath, the ocean is his waist, hills and mountains, the stacks, and the bones of the passing ages are his movements. And I just love this imagery that the trees on the planet, on this planet, are the hairs on the body of God, and the rivers are the veins on his cosmic body. So you see, how much, how much time? Five minutes? Oh, sorry? Okay, all right. I'm almost done, I think. So what this, le- what, yeah, I am almost done. Um, <clears throat> what I'm trying to get to is that um, all of these things, the, the, div- the divinity in the natural world, the fact that animals and people are all sacred and all manifesting from Brahma, all of equal spiritual value, is that ultimately Hinduism is suggesting that we are always in constant relationship with the natural world. We are always in constant relationship. We cannot not be in relationship. Even not being in relationship is a form of relationship. So better that we have some kind of active understanding of what that relationship is. And, And it's important that Hinduism suggests that Um, there are different kinds of relationships. Just as we are students maybe here, when we go home, maybe we're a son or a daughter. When we go out into the world of work, we're different. If we have a partner, we have a different relationship there. We have different relationships in the world. And that means we also have different relationships with nature. And this is most um, nicely kind of illustrated when it comes to forests. Um, In Hinduism, there are three different kinds of forests because we have different kinds of relationships with the forests. Uh, The first type of forest is called a tapovan. This is a forest where the saints and the meditators and the yogis would live and where you would be allowed to go to get some um, relief from the modern world, let's say, and just have some spiritual nourishment and just to escape the day-to-day. So there was like a place where you would go for spirituality. And it's actually in these old Tapovan forests where you find some of the oldest temples in India. And then you have the Mahavan. The Mahavan is the great forest. And the great forest is where you have everyone. You have the animals, the tigers, the birds, and everything else. But you also have people living there as well. And everyone is welcome to live in the, in the Mahavan. And then you have the Srivan. The Srivan is the forest where you go for prosperity and goodness where you go to get your food, where you would go to get the wood that you need to burn for fuel. And oftentimes this third category, the Srivan, would oftentimes be maintained by a local temple. And so you see there's no singular relationship with nature. There are multiple relationships with nature, recognizing that we are complex people and that we need to differentiate between, okay, this is my place for spirituality, this is my place for living, and this is my place essentially for commerce and for sustenance, right? 
And so there's no singular relationship. And I, I, I bring this up because oftentimes, you know, we paint a romantic idea of what our relationship should be with nature. You have the one extreme, which is that, you know, oh no, we should have no interaction with nature. We should not be interacting. We should just leave nature alone and not do anything with her and just leave her by herself. And then you have the other, other extreme, which is like, no, nature is there for humans to exploit and for dominion and we can just take. And Hinduism, I believe, is kind of saying, no, there needs to be some kind of balance. You know, you can take from nature to a certain degree and you have to leave nature alone to a certain degree, but you also have to engage with nature as well, right? Understanding that we are complex people and we need to find that balance between how much do we take from nature and how much do we respect and just leave alone because we know the more we destroy nature, the more we destroy ourselves. So I'm going to end with a story about a cow. You can't have a talk about Hinduism without a story about a cow. Am I right? Right? If people know one thing about Hinduism, it's like cows and curry, right? I'm not going to talk about curry, but I will talk about cows. And it's a story about the spiritual work that needs to take place that Hinduism suggests to, to restore um, vitality and health to the earth. It's a story from the Bhagavad Purana. I'll try and be quick about it. <clears throat> there was a cow and it was sitting on the ground and it was dark and it was crying and it was very unhappy. And a bull walked over to the cow. And the bull was only walking on one leg. And the bull asked the cow, why are you sad? And the cow spoke. The cow said, I am the earth. I am the representation of the earth. And I am sad because you, the bull, you are dharma. You are religion personified. And historically, there were four legs of religion. And in the current age, only one leg of religion is standing. So as religion is being destroyed in the current age, me as the cow, as the representation of the earth, I am suffering because I, as the earth, cannot survive if religion is not being upheld, if dharma is not being upheld. And so the bull represented dharma, the religion personified. And the four legs traditionally of dharma are of self-restraint, of purity, of compassion, and truth. And the Hindu texts say that these are the four legs of dharma. These are the four legs of um, good behavior, of spirituality. And in, sub, in, in different ages, a different leg of dharma is taken away, is removed from society because we can no longer sustain that leg. And so self-restraint is taken away. Now there's like no restraint. You can do whatever you want. There's no sense of purity or cleanliness. There's no sense of compassion in the world anymore. And so the, the bull was standing there on this final leg of truth. And we all know right now how much truth is under attack in the modern world. And so the earth in the form of the cow was crying, saying, I cannot continue when all your legs are being taken away. And now this final leg of truth is also under attack. And so a king arrives, King Parikshit. Some of you may know that name. Um, and he goes, what's going on here? Why is this cow crying? And why is this bull only standing on one leg? Like, you know, he tries to get a sense of the situation and a discourse takes place and someone else comes in. And eventually what happens is the king rehabilitates the cow. He restores, so he rehabilitates the bull. He restores the bull. He restores the legs of self-restraint, purity, and compassion. So the bull again is standing on all of its four legs. And in the commentary to this, to this passage, um, teachers say that when the bull was restored to its full health, the earth was happy again. Because the earth is only happy when religion is standing on all of its four legs. And so I'm sharing this because so much of this work is about, you know, the financing of addressing climate change and the biodiversity crisis, about, you know, the external work that needs to go on. But I'm sharing this story because at its heart, what Hinduism is suggesting, and I think all of us in this room know, is that at the heart of this crisis is a spiritual crisis of the human spirit. That somehow along the way, we have lost our way and greed and capitalism and economic development have come in, have taken over 
what we know is good and true, which is that community, being nice people, being caring to the earth is what is so much required and is so much at the heart of our religious and spiritual traditions. And so Hinduism is suggesting that in addition to the external work that needs to go on, that internal work of spiritual growth also needs to take place. And the person who said it the best was a local Bostonian, my good friend, Ralph Waldo Emerson, where in his essay, Nature, he said that the problem of restoring to the world original and eternal beauty is solved by the redemption of the soul. You all know this phrase, this, this section. The ruin or the blank that we see when we look at nature is in our own eye, and the reason why the world lacks unity and lies broken and in heaps is because man is disunited from himself. Emerson said it. Obviously, he was a student of Hinduism. He's, he read many Hindu texts. I'm not saying he took this from Hinduism, but it's a truth that goes back many hundreds of years, if not many thousands of years, that the work starts internally. We need to make the internal shifts if we were to see the external shift. And this is the external shift that we need to make. We are currently on a significant downward trajectory when it comes to biodiversity. We are in very, very difficult situations right now, but we can turn the tide. And so the work is on to get to a nature positive world um, by 2030 and then up from there, hopefully, the sky's the limit. And that's why I'm so grateful for Tara for inviting me today and for all of you for the work you're doing because this is so crucially and vitally important. Thank you very much. Not a first question, I will ask one. Eric, go ahead. Can, you want me to speak up or is the mic can can people hear Eric? Okay, go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, this is a very nice slide. Mm. It's It's, it's a good question. I, I, I don't think, and, and Tara's the environmental expert here, <laughs> so I may, I may not talk okay. to you directly, but I think she may be able to answer it better than I can. Is this on? Can you hear yeah. me okay? Yeah. Um, yeah. My, my understanding of that obviously is not that, you know, these extinct species can, can come back to life, but that um, the species that are on the brink of extinction or species that are under threat we can turn that we that we need to try and turn the tide on them on that as much as possible as quickly as possible that that's my understanding but i will defer to you if you well edward wilson put a statistic out that if we were to conserve 50% of our land and sea that we would be able to conserve about 85% of our species by around 2050 um, so it's an acknowledgement that there's there we are going to lose on the whole and that ecosystems will change over time to have different compositions. But the idea is that we want to hold on to as many of our native species and regions um, and not have them go extinct because they do serve particular values in those ecosystems. But I agree with you that maybe a fuller recovery to what it was in the past would be really hard, especially when, since we've already lost so many species. So those are gone, they will not come back. Um, although there is experimentation to sort of bring back genetics and in sort of different ways, and, and that may be a real uh, reality in the future. Yeah. Pat. So this is just a follow-up to Eric's question about the speciation rate. So in addition to extinction, there is a speciation rate. Um, and I don't know if my view is that the speed of land um, certainly has kind of flipped uh, the extinction, the approach to extinction is through the that's true, yes, but it's, I don't know what the actual rate is, but it's um, much higher in the extinction. We're losing more species than we are creating new species. Mm. Praveen.
Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Did everyone hear the question? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the, the question was, and Praveen, correct me if I'm wrong, the question was, you know, as we work in a multi-faith context, what is, is there one teaching or one idea that kind of spans different religious traditions that we can use to help mobilize people into action? <clears throat> and I spoke about it over lunch with, with some of the students. I, I think in every religious tradition, there's an idea or something that points towards the sacredness of creation. Um, but that differs in different traditions. And the, the example I gave at lunch was that as a Hindu, I can look at a tree and, and recognize the inherent spirituality of that tree, recognize the intrinsic value of that tree, recognize that the soul, the atma that animates my body is also living in that tree as well. Um, there are some traditions that can't go that far, that they can, they can see the sacredness of the tree only because it's created by God, but not that it has a life which is independent just as my life is independent, right? And so there are variations between how, in my experience, about how different religious traditions may talk about the sacredness of creation, but I think there's an agreement that creation is sacred, we just may have different understandings of what that is. And I think that's the starting point for us in the multi-faith context that, okay, we can agree it's sacred, we may differ on why we think it's sacred or how it's sacred, but we can agree it's sacred. It comes from God in some shape or form. And so that's the kind of the baseline that we use. Um, that's one of the well, it's one of the ideas that spans across traditions. Yeah. Yeah. Uh oh. <laughs> Yeah, no, it, 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 it's true, and it, it's, it's a charge that's leveled at not just Hinduism, but I think the Dharmic faiths in general. Um, there's, a, there's a joke in the Buddhist community that they, they need to learn to get off their asanas. Um, you know, so like there's, a, there's a, somewhat of an um, idea that in the Dharmic faiths and in Hinduism that we don't, in, we don't really engage with the world, as you're saying, because things will look after themselves. And... And on one level, that's a valid argument that the world will look after itself, that the world is self-correcting, that the earth, I didn't mention it in my talk, but the earth herself is a goddess, Bhumi is a goddess who takes the form of a planet. Um, and so on one level, yes, it is considered to be, well, things will be okay. But the flip side of that is that we all have a responsibility to act in the world. And in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, you know, regardless, you have to act. So act in a good way, act in a way that's for the betterment of other people and for the planet. And so the argument that we make is that you're going to have to act in the world anyway, whether you want to or not. Make sure the action that you perform is healthy, healthy towards the environment. And so that's what we say, rather than saying, and that's what we, that, when I say to serve, that's what we say. We don't say to control. We don't, you know, we, we don't try to talk about saving the earth. What we say is, from a Hindu perspective, the earth has her own um, consciousness and she it knows what's going on. She literally knows what's going on from a Hindu perspective. And so our perspective is that how do we serve the earth? What does the earth need right now? And right now she is going under immense difficulty because, our, because of our behavior. So how do we shift human behavior to revive the health of the earth? Now, if the earth wants to go into a period of decline, that's for the earth to decide herself. We can't control that. We can't change her mind. All we can do is be the best versions of ourselves and show up in a healthy way to ensure that we are not inflicting unnecessary harm on the planet. Thank you. So I have a question. Um, we were talking earlier about this period of time being a transition in the way we communicate, mm. um, the, the vast amount of information that's available on the internet, also the way we use social media. Um, and 
what I see and what I hear from students is the sort of the unraveling of relationships with nature, mm. not actively cultivating that, not really knowing what tree species are in their larger ecosystem, um, what insects are in their ecosystem, what, what the birds are, the species. And there's been some work that shows that, that the average you know, person, young person today knows more of the marketing labels than, than tree species. So how do we develop those relationships, especially in urban environments that are very managed and tend to manage for a certain aesthetic and not necessarily the forest that you described um, in, um, in your slide. And what, what do you recommend for students and people in general in these places to develop that important relationship with nature in order to connect their faith to, to that? So it's a, it's a good question. Um, I'll be honest and say, I don't know the species in, in, in the <laughs> town that I live, you know, I can't name them. Um, and, and I'm kind of okay with that. And because for me, and what I would suggest is that, if I get kicked out for this, kick me out. But, um, but I don't think, I personally don't think we, we all need to know all of it, mm -hmm. right? I think what is, mo what is most important is that we, we develop, a, we, we understand that we are in relationship with nature and understand that every action we're taking is impacting nature in some way. And so, like I said at lunchtime, starting with the, the breakfast, lunch, and dinner that we may, that we may have, like that's a, that's a conscious decision we're making at least three times a day if we're fortunate to have three meals about what kind of impact I'm having on the environment. You know, where is this food coming from? You know, if, 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 if an animal was killed, how was that animal killed? Where was it killed? Where was it transported from, right? And so I, I, I come from the perspective of in, in the different moments in the day, in the different activities, how are we conscious about, are we conscious about what impact we're having on the environment? And how are we trying to mitigate that as much as possible? I, I often think for me, like that's the starting point because that's what's worked for me is just like, okay, in Hinduism, you know, there's a prayer, I don't know the prayer, but oftentimes when the Hindus, when they wake up, they'll say a prayer to the earth before they put their foot on the ground. They'll say something akin to Mother Earth, please forgive me as I walk on you today. You know, so these little prayers, these little rituals, these little mantras we can we can say to ourselves about, oh, I'm about to eat something, or I'm about to take this mode of transportation, or I'm about to do something, and that I may not see the direct connection, but there is a connection, there is a relationship. And because of modern society, those there are many chains and links in that relationship that we're not conscious of. And so I would suggest starting there. Um, because I don't, because I like trees. I don't feel like I need to know the trees that are in my neighborhood. I just don't, you know, I feel like, and I feel like we have so much going on, especially young people that the information overload is overwhelming. And so I, I suggest start with like what you're doing on a daily basis. And if you have an inclination to learn what trees are in your neighborhood, or if you have an inclination to go and clean up the local river or the local park, do it. But I don't think that everybody needs to do that because, because the Hindu perspective is that, you know, some people will do that and some people will do other things and some people will do other things. And it's about everybody working um, in a way that's comfortable and in alignment to who they are rather than everybody trying to act in a, in a singular way. And that, that would be my suggestion. You can kick me out now. No, no, you can stay. <laughs> oh, we have three questions. I, we haven't heard from Sarah.
Yeah, it's a good question. So, um, you know, the, the groups that we work with are, 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 are pretty much a self-selecting group of religious organizations. Like they, they're showing up at the UN, they're working in a multi-faith context because they feel like that's the right thing to do. Obviously, there are groups within every single religious community that don't think interfaith work is important and don't think the United Nations is important. And so we don't work with them because they're not at the table. Um, in terms of identifying what the priorities are, we kind of we take a two-pronged approach. We, at least with the work we're doing responding to the, to the global biodiversity framework, we just read through the text. You know, we read through the text as a group and we were like, okay, what's, what's coming up here? What's emerging? What, what are we feeling uneasy about? Um, and through a process of kind of like refining that, we came up with our six themes. And so I mentioned some of them were a little bit more stronger on and some of them are a little bit weaker on, but we decided to go with, go with the six. And so one way we did it, did it was to go through the text and see what came up. And then the other side was, well, what do, what's missing in the text that we really feel needs to be there? That, um, because the UN are bureaucrats, technical experts, you know, and so we're people from faith-based organizations what can we lend from our perspective and our voice that is that we feel is missing? And so that's kind of how we came to our, our, our six priority areas. Um, remind me again, the indigenous people's question. Sorry, I, I missed that. Oh, I forgot that. Sure. Um, so we, 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 made a, we made a conscious decision because under the, um, under the framework of the Convention on Biological Diversity, there are different stakeholder groups. And within that, um, indigenous peoples have their own stakeholder group. And so we were very clear that what we're going to be is we're going to be a religious group. And so we're working with the world religions, as you say. Um, and we're working in alignment and supporting the points that the indigenous community is putting forward. But we're being very clear that we're talking from, from a religious perspective and not representing indigenous voices because they have their own voice, but we're in 100% alignment with everything they're saying. So that's how we were able to do that. And that's oftentimes, um, in this space it was okay, but sometimes it doesn't get contentious, but sometimes it is a bit of a balancing act because sometimes certain religious groups want to bring in indigenous voices into the faith space. And sometimes the indigenous groups are saying, no, we don't want to be part of the faith voice. We want to have our own voice because in the faith voice, we get drowned out or we can't say everything that we want to. And so sometimes that can be a little bit problematic. Um, but in the case of this biodiversity work, it's been very clear that we are representing the faiths of the world and the indigenous groups are representing themselves and they have their own agency. Yeah, it's a good question. Matt, you had a question. Good question. Statements have come out from the other faith traditions. Um, we, my organization, we put out the, the main Hindu declaration on climate in 2015. It's the, it's the most signed Hindu declaration on climate ever. We had about 60 to 70 Hindu groups sign it. There was a Buddhist declaration on climate change also in 2015. The Jewish community came out with a statement from, I think, a group of rabbis also in 2015. 2015 was kind of the year when a number of kind of big statements came out taking the Pope's lead. Um, so those statements are there from other religious and spiritual groups. Um, are they needed? I, I think it depends on the structure and the nature of the religious organization that we're talking about. I mean, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not a Catholic, so I don't know, you know the, the structure of it exactly, but you know, the Pope is the pinnacle and you know, people, people look to or are supposed to look to him for guidance and inspiration, right? Um, but not every religious organization is, is, is structured like that. And so like within the Hindu community, there's no single figure, there's no single body that could issue a statement that would have anywhere near the um, implications or the impact that Lodato C had. And so I think it's less about 
copying the Pope or like, you know, doing that, but more about what would work in a specific religious community or tradition? What will push the needle forward to move people into action? And in, for the Catholic Church, obviously, it was something like Laudato Si. In the Hindu community, it will look different. In the Jewish community, it will look different, and so on like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I would say, I would say it's problematic, but not a problem. Like in the sense that we have concerns about that framing, but we, but we as the faith community, um, we don't, we don't have to live by that definition. That's the UN's definition. And what we're trying to do, as I mentioned, with these consultations we're going to do this year, is talk about ecosystem restoration through the lens of spirituality, values, and culture. To say that there are other nature has value beyond the value towards human society and civilization there is intrinsic nature there's intrinsic value to nature and so um, the statement is there the un obviously that's that that definition was probably hammered through multiple negotiations through every single member state and unfortunately that's the that's the framing that they they're most comfortable with that kind of anthropocentric you know utilitarian framing but you know a big ship like the UN, you know, takes 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 time to turn, and you know we're plugging away at it slowly. And what we're seeing are, are movements to kind of get to the place where we want to. The whole the whole work around the rights of nature is really really taking shape. You know, in different parts of the world now, you're seeing countries giving personhood to nature. In India, in I think in Peru and in other places as well, where a river should have personhood and a forest should be protected for it, for its right to exist. And so you're seeing the shifts taking place, and it's not going to be easy, and it's not going to be immediate. Um, but I feel the work we're doing is really trying to move move the dialogue in, in in that direction. So I think we have time for one more question, Sunan. I saw your hand up. How does the how did you reach here? How did, how have you gotten here if our faith was something that's intrinsic to serve and to expand? Is that what you do? I mean I don't mean it myself. Is that what you do with this faith? Is it a gap in the social and stuff that exists today? Economic crisis, scarcity, money can be so quick to go out. All the things that are realities of the spiritual element. 
I, I didn't catch the second question, but the first one, just the first question um, was, just so everyone can hear it, was around kind of <laughs> what happened to India, right? Where, um, where I'm talking about this philosophy and this understanding and this worldview, and then you go to India today, if those of you who have been, it's um, environmentally, it's a, it's a mess, in, you know, to put it lightly. And in, India's facing significant environmental challenges. <clears throat> I should say I was not born in India, I was born in England. Um, you know, I live here in the United States, and so my experience of India is mostly as a pilgrim um, and work a little bit. I have no more, no family in India, so my experience is, is limited. So, but, you know, from my understanding, you know, India, um, you know, was it Nehru, the first prime minister of India, who said the factories are the new temples of India? Um, you know, and, you know, there's just been a, a, you know, at the time of India's independence, you know, coming out of, you know, the British Empire, um, you know, you know, struggling, it had to adopt Western, you know, uh, models of economic growth and prosperity. And unfortunately, those are models which, which put nature, you know, at a distance and say that nature is there for us to exploit and to take from. And so I, I was mentioning this earlier that, you know, what's, what's in, what I find interesting about India is that you have these philosophies, which are not just in Hinduism, but in the other Dharmic faiths of Jainism, Sikhism and Buddhism, but you have like a, a, a governance system and the laws which come from the British, which are in many ways informed by um, Christian understandings of, of, how, of how the world operates. And so India is like a very interesting test case in that sense, because you have this culture of the people which looks at nature as sacred and looks at the interconnectedness of all life. And then you have a, a governance system and a financial system, which is, you know, in, in many ways, the opposite of that. Um, and so the, 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 the two systems don't meet. They kind of like keep, keep missing each other. Um, and then you just have Indian bureaucracy. And you probably can speak to that <laughs> better than I can, you know. Um, and so India's in a, right, in a difficult, difficult place. And I don't see an easy path out of the environmental challenges that India's facing. And... Um, and the current government, although publicly it says the right things, you know, we know the environmental policies of the current administration aren't as strong as they need to be. And we know that the disappointment that was there in COP26 when, when India and China at the last minute on, 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 the, on the issue of coal. Um, so, so there is work that needs to be done, but it's not just in India, it's everywhere. We've all bought into capitalism. We've all bought into the concept that greed is good. We've all bought into the concept that GDP is the marker of success and growth. And like that needs to be fundamentally challenged in every part of the world because we're seeing the most prosperous country in the world, people are not happy, right? And so there's something that's gone fundamentally wrong and there needs to be a, um, a reorientation, a spiritual reorientation, not just in India, but everywhere else as well. We'll, we'll talk more over dinner. Well, it wouldn't be an environmental talk if we didn't bring a little doomism into <laughs> it. But I just want to say thank you um, to Gopal Patel for coming to Boston College and giving this really thought-provoking talk. Um, I know it's left me with a lot of, lot of food for thought. And thank you for starting us off this semester and our Rewilding Planet Earth series. Don't forget to come back March 1st for Billion Oyster Project and check out the other events that we have for the semester. So can you please join me in giving a, a wonderful applause for the Thank you.